initially we were thinking that we wanted something extra on this release and we were thinking that there was a fifth feature of the four the English ones that we know that hadn't been sort of seen and then I think you said well actually there's another three that were in uh, Italy that we hadn't known about so um yeah, so we, I think we, we thought, well, why not let's just remaster uh, in high definition all, all of them, you know. In fact, there's, so there's seven Italian ones and the one, I think, that came out in uh, Turkey. It's one of these things where you, you think, yeah, OK, that's just kind of a fairly quick and easy thing. But as you look into it, and you, once you start work on it, it's, it's more complicated than you imagine. <laughs> yeah. um, what was surprising is that some of the elements that were sort of uh, fairly unique, uh, in a way, to those uh, films... Um, for example, in, in Sporting Charts, you have a, a, a linking sequence in the middle that's from To the Death Baby. And it is, in fact, more or less the whole um, episode credits uh, from that episode. But it's the Texas background. Now, I think when they were making that, um, putting that film together, they just thought, oh, well, we've got the negative of the Texas background here, so let's cut it into the master. Um, we've got dupes of the episodes. That's fine. That's it. That's that, we'll, we'll use that. But the problem is... Um, they don't have any elements on Sporting Charts anymore. Um, there's no film holdings for that particular compilation film. So, OK, you've got the episode material, the, the main two episodes that, that make that up. Um, but when it comes to certain things like the, the bit in the middle and, say, the film end credit roller that they made up, you know, um, we had to actually uh, track down a collector with a 35 millimetre print um, in order to get something that we could use. Wasn't that a blessing, though, in some ways? Because on Sporting Chance, you've got that terrible cartoon kind of racing drawing at the front. To be honest, it would be better if we could lose that. Absolutely. And I, I did look at that. And that was one thing that stuck in my mind when I bought it on, on video all those years ago in, in the 80s. And I, when I put the tape in, the, the familiar <laughs> classic you know, theme tune came up. I, I, I stared at this thing. I thought, what, what is that? What, what is this sort of felt tip drawing of racing cars you know I, did, I couldn't believe it actually um and the trouble is you know that i think we all agree that the actual series title sequence is so iconic so well put together and crafted and everything that that screams to you tv series you know it's it's a four by three format it's um it's so ingrained in our in our heads that um you look at that and you think yeah that is a the classic tv series final sequence so when you then try and um, if you think about it as a, as a film thing, you, it doesn't really work. You've got to have something different if you're mm. if you're serving up a, a film format, you know. Um, and so what I looked at, I looked at, uh, we were lucky enough a few years back, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Mark Stanborough, found at ITV some um, cans from the optical department, which is where they used to copy off all the bits that were going to have fades and titles and things like that. And it had some longer takes. And, and in there, you know, you've got extra shots that they shot at the, the racing track with the racing cars, and you've got ones on, on Brighton at night and things like that. And I looked at it and I thought, that's ideal. We, we, let's put that together and make up a new title sequence. Because I, I thought to myself, um, there's two things that we need to do here on the titles. Um, there's a refreshing of them, and there's uh, completely new ones. Now, the refreshing side of it, um, we've taken the notion of... of most uh, of a feature film as, as, as far as we can so we've actually done everything in, in 178 widescreen 16 by 9 done it uh, as to look a bit more cinematic mm. and um you look at the some of the early one the first one they did mission monte carlo they actually did a, a, a pretty good job there they thought well let's take the water ski sequence we've already got uh music under it that's fine we just add the captions on there's our titles and that actually worked quite well so the only thing is, when you look at that now, the captioning on that sequence is like the, the captions are huge and they're right over the action. So, you, for example, you get that first credit, Tony Curtis, Roger Moore in. It's right over the water skiers. Massive caption. So I was looking at the, the widescreen framing from the, the HD masters and I thought, well, I've got acres of sky there they're, and, they're, and they don't have to be that large. So you make them smaller put them in the sky works fine so that's what i mean by refreshing of it but as you say when it came to something like sporting chance i thought this has got to be redone because it's just <laughs> this is the thing the persuaders is such a classy series you know the, the money thrown of it the people involved everything about it is great when you start looking with a bit of more of a microscope at these compilation films they're kind of hastily put together 
and they didn't spend a lot of time or care on them. I think that they, they, maybe they could have done. So um, I think in, on occasions we've now uh, made new title sequences. And the idea is that um, I limited myself to either footage that was shot by the production team or stock footage that they actually bought in. So you get sometimes like Trafalgar Square and things like that actually used in one episode. And that way, anything I created could have been done back in 1974 if they wanted to. Yeah. You know what I mean? I didn't want to do something super flashy, super modern that they couldn't have done or, or use new shots or something like that. You know, it had to be contemporary. Um, so everything that's been done could have been done by optical printing and the, the shots they made themselves. So we have created... Um, some new titles for some of them. So Sporting Chance has got a new title. London Conspiracy has got a new title because it originally used the TV titles, but did a similar thing, I think, to, to foreign countries where they just had a black rectangle over sections of the original title mm -hmm. so they could put new credits on. I mean, mm -hmm. talk about ruining it. You know what I mean? It just doesn't look very good. Mm -hmm. So again, I thought that's got to be changed. I think the point is with these films, you know, you've had you've had the uh, original releases in the in the cinemas. You've had the the early video cassettes. You've had it as an extra on the DVD set. You've had it as extras on the Blu-ray set in SD. So if you want those old original versions, I mean, they're there. They're they're available. No, they're not going to disappear. But uh, I I feel that they do let the side down a little bit. Um, you know, when you compare it to the quality of the series, you know. Um, and as uh, Barry Norman said when he interviewed Roger Moore at the 40th event, you know, um, these are like mini feature films and they're fully seasoned cinema directors as well that, that did a lot of these. So uh, I must admit, while I was doing it, you can see, you can see that the quality is there. You know, you, you, you haven't got to make that up. It's already there. Um, and um, framing it for widescreen, it kind of, it works, you know and um the shooting and the style of it and the gloss and everything it's all it's all already there but i think i just wanted to complete the notion of movies a bit more it's almost like then they'd done half the job when they did it before uh the other uh, thing is the the fades to black as well i mean when you, you think about a normal episode and of course it's constructed for mainly for um american television you've got four or five fades to black well that that will work. That works in the context of a TV broadcast where you want to shoehorn commercials in, but within a film, it doesn't really work. So it was interesting. On the first one they did, Mission Monte Carlo, they'd actually gone to some pains to cut those out, but in cutting them out, um, they were a little bit uh, abrupt sometimes at the at the, at the break points. So um, I wanted to sort of smooth that over a little bit more. And then, uh, interesting enough, when you then get to some of the other uh, ones like I think like the switch and things like that they all the sort of fades were there and that was a bit odd because literally you know you go 10 12 15 minutes and then there's another fade to black and it doesn't really work within the context of a feature film um, especially when I think there was an example in um, Sporting Chance where they go to the house and the I think the racing driver who's who was in the race with Roger is sort of sitting in a chair they see he's in a chair, goes to the commercial break, and it comes back, and, they, and they're still in the house about to talk to him. Well, that just doesn't work within the context of a film. So I had to do something there. Um, so I think really what, what it's all about, if people say, oh, it's, you know, you're re re revising history and things like that, you know, the original versions are readily available. Um, we're trying to complete the notion of persuaders films in the best presentation we can, and that's that, that was the idea of it, really. And also to bring the three Italian versions into English uh, ones that hadn't been seen before. Can I ask you about those briefly? Did you in, in, um, come into much trouble with those in terms of um, source material and um, how they how they worked again as movies in their format? Because obviously um, they haven't ever really been seen in this country. And um, you could get them on videotape from Italy, um, but again, they're so rare, you know, because the Italians didn't really use the home video format. 
Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I know that I have seen them, but I was wondering what your experiences of seeing them for the first time and how you sort of made them into a UK feature worked. Well, um, thankfully, you, you managed to supply some guides that I used for, for those uh, last three Italian uh, compilation films. I, I think they tend to work best when they have quickened the action slightly. So rather than just taking two full episodes and basically putting them together, they've speeded the pace along a bit by pulling up things here, maybe dropping a little bit of a scene there, whatever. So you get a sort of like 85 to 90 minutes experience. And I think that works better within a sort of feature format. Mm. Um, and so obviously I followed those uh, guides um, as well as I could. Um, I mean, a lot of the uh, the prints that they used for those video versions were really beaten up. I mean, those frames <laughs> missing all over the place, you know what I mean? So obviously we haven't got that. And um, so they run a little bit longer because they're, they're, they're complete shots rather than being hacked down. Yeah. But uh, what was interesting on the, the one with To the Death Baby in it, and I think that is a last appointment. Well, when it came to that, they've, sh they've shifted the order of some of the scenes around, which was interesting. Yeah. So you start with, um, I think, Tony Curtis and Roger Moore sort of um, with the archery, whatever. Then it goes to the scene where they're looking at the, at the lady that they're going to sort of do a con on or whatever. And then, and then so um, I thought, well, OK, well, I'll, I'll keep it that way. So I swapped them around to match. And then there was a little bit of um, dialogue later on that didn't work with those scenes in that order. So, again, I had to be a bit creative. Uh, and managed to cut around that. And I thought, well, I wonder that, of course, you don't know for sure if they've changed the script. You know, mm. they, 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 you know they, they've gone to a foreign dub, gone to a foreign country. They don't have to follow it exactly as, as the English version, do they? So they may have reworded something to fit that order. But of course, we don't have that luxury because we're not going to revoice any of the actors. So I had to get around it another way. But it Hmm. I, I managed to leave it in that order, and I think it, it makes it um, maybe a bit more interesting to see it in that order for a, the first time. Within this set of films, we wanted to do all eight. So that's the seven Italian ones and, and this other one that was in Turkey. And of course, the, the good thing about that one is had overture. So you kind of think, OK, if you're doing a movie set, you do want that introductory episode to be there. The trouble was, of course, because it was two different territories, they used Man in the Middle um, for the second half of that film. And Man in the Middle was obviously already in The Last Appointment. And so the last thing we wanted was 45 minutes duplicated footage of the same story. So it got me thinking. I thought, we're going to have to do something different here. We're going to have it for the second half of that first film. And I thought about, um, you know, what episodes hadn't been used in, in the compilations. And, and of course, I can see why they picked Man in the Middle, because you've got kind of two feature names in there. You've got, you know, Terry Thomas and Susie Kendall. And they, they probably thought, oh, well, that goes well. You know, you've got more star names. And I thought, what other episode have we got that uh, is quite an early one? So it fits with Overture. Um, it's got some nice location shooting in it. And it's also got a star name. And, and it had to be Five Miles to Midnight with uh, Joan Collins. So I set about um, putting those two episodes together. And that's where I thought I'd bitten off more than I could chew because I thought, how do I get from the Côte d'Azur and, and the Nice area over to, over to Rome, you know, with linking these two together? I just feel like we've been able to bring the, the films up a little bit to sort of, not obviously not to the level of the series, but to complete that journey a bit more and improve the presentation of them brought up to the sort of standard of what you did with those Blu-rays in that set, you know, so it's given them a, a new lease of life. And I think they kind of deserved it after all this time, really. And I'm so glad that you've sort of revisited them and not only revisited the English ones, but you've also gone the extra mile and got the ones that actually do complete the set. So now we've got the whole experience of all the Persuaders movies. So this book is called The Time and the Place, and basically it's a visual celebration of all the Persuaders merchandise from around the world, including, um, I think there's about 100 uh, film posters in there, predominantly um, Italian ones uh, for all the movies, but there's obviously posters from places like Pakistan, 
uh, Thailand, uh, Spain, Argentina, um, and also there's lots more in this book. It's not just the film posters. For example, um, we've got original scripts in there. This is uh, Roger Moore's original script from Chain of Events. Uh, we've got all the merchandise that you can think of that was licensed. Um, and hopefully lots of stuff that you won't know about because um, this series was a global phenomenon and lots and lots of the merchandise was released all across the globe, but some of it in very small quantities. So, for example, in Israel, there are paperback books. There's even a board game that comes from Israel, which um, is it's based on the persuaders and you just you know you probably wouldn't have ever known about it you know it's one of these things that until the sort of world opened up with the internet lots of these items were sort of only in their little lo local sort of uh, territory you know so I'm hoping that there'll be lots of items that people won't know about um, and it's a visual feast really for everyone to who loves the persuaders to enjoy the basically the persuaders the product not only have you got the two episodes with the retro advert breaks in which people enjoy but you've got the the special network programs which incorporate roger moore and tony curtis being interviewed and you've got over an hour of footage of them talking there so i mean it's great obviously to to hear some of their stories and um i think uh the little snippets that people have seen of tony in the um persuaders documentary that was made for the uh original uh release um will find there's a lot more depth to that interview and when you've got like the full half hour um of, of uh, and he really goes through it and he and he, he you know he loved doing that series he loved it and he thought the result was excellent and that really comes across in the interview yeah and just as a fan i have to say that evening was spectacular and exactly the kind of thing that we wanted to see we wanted to see some new um interviews or whatever because you know we we'd seen the snippets in the documentary and they were they were kind of just a little bit of the story and we all knew that there was more so uh we're so grateful that you've gone to the effort to basically allow everyone else to have access to them by releasing this set